Hey guys, I'm Jason. As most of you already know, because uh, you've been watching these videos already, this is video number six. Sheet Metal 308A C of Q review or refresher. So obviously your guys are struggling and you got to get this thing passed, get this weight off your shoulders. So you've come to the right place. So let's get started. Alright, so uh, anyways, thanks to everybody that's uh, been commenting on the YouTube channel. Thanks to guys that are getting back to me with um, questions from the C of Q because um, if we don't uh, kind of help each other out this way, so there's so many questions on the C of Q that just, it just it's so crazy and don't make sense. If we don't get them written down and start to figure out what's going on with these questions, we'll never... You guys are never going to be able to pass this because whoever keeps adding these questions to the C of Q, like whatever teachers or part, whoever's putting these new questions on the C of Q should look into a mirror and punch themselves in the face because it has nothing to do with sheet metal. They're just trick questions that are just, I can screw with people. So, uh, let's go with something easy. I've been doing math and pattern for so long now, you guys are getting sick of it. So I'm going to try to just do some of these really crazy questions that and that people can't figure out, but it's all about thinking and reading the question through. So, but I wanna go over one that's a, a new version because I don't think I've got over, it is one little bit of math, a little bit of estimating. So the question goes, you have a building, eight, this is a pretty simple question, but some guys have trouble visualizing it because they don't draw a picture of it. You have a building that's eight feet high and it's 24 feet in diameter. So basically, it's just a round building. So, a building, 24 feet in diameter, eight feet high. And of course, they're not gonna draw you the picture. It's gonna say eight foot high, 24 feet in diameter. Okay, your sheets are eight by four. So the sheets will stand up Like that. Now it didn't say what I didn't. The person who gave this to me didn't say whether or not there was an overlap. So we'll just play it as a four foot wide sheet, 24 feet in diameter, right? So how do we figure out how round that is? Pi times diameter, 24 feet, works out to something like 78 feet. Whoops. Where's my calculator? And I'll tell you exactly what it is. Uh, 24 times 3.14, 75 feet, 0.36, divided by a four foot wide sheet, equals 18.84, so basically 19 sheets. So these are the kind of questions, again, with estimating, you guys should be able to recognize this from reading. They're not gonna give you this picture, but you should be able to figure it out. Eight feet high, 24 feet round. When I say 24 feet round, I mean the diameter, right? And if they say that the diameter means it's something round. Like if they say if it's a pipe or a duct or spiral, if it's 12 inches or 20, it's a diameter, right? So these are the basic things that you guys should be able to recognize. Okay, so we're gonna go on from there. We're, we're gonna talk about questions that, um, Okay guys, I don't know if you can read this. It uh, looks like it's coming through pretty clear. What metal is used for, an, I just did it short for them. What metal is used for an MRI exam room? So this is one of your thinking questions because not like I would have ever learned this or anybody's taught this in school. They're making you think for yourself on this question. Now again, this is one of those questions I think you should just fucking, whoever put this on the test should be punched. But, because it's only going to, the only guys that are going to answer it are the guys that are fucking really smart. Or that can actually think for themselves. So first of all, lead, galvanized, aluminum, copper. Right? But what does MRI stand for? Magnetic Resonance Imaging. So, if you think magnetic, oh, ferrous, non-ferrous. Magnetic, non-magnetic. 
aluminum. Now, does that make any sense to me? I don't know, because how would I know if that would, unless you've actually built one of these rooms and we're told, hey, you gotta use aluminum for this very reason. And I've checked with a teacher and he agrees with me that that's the answer. But again, you know, the average apprentice wouldn't have a clue for this question. But anyways, we're gonna move on. And uh, that's probably, I'm only gonna write some of these down. A lot of these we're just gonna talk about because I'll be writing for days. I'm gonna do as many questions that when I write, when I talk about the question, write it down. Pause the video, write it down, okay? All right, I'm gonna try to go through these as fast as I possibly can so we can get as many done. Okay, so if you guys know what uh, your fusible link melts in a, in a fire damper, 165. And if it's in a wall, it's a vertical fire damper, and if it's in a floor, it's a horizontal fire damper. So like, what type of fire damper goes into a wall? Vertical, 165, right? Here's another question. What is used to smoothen out when insulating ductwork? And again, what kind of, like, the only thing I've seen, like, with insulating ductwork is the, uh, the choices are sponge, cloth, or a trowel. And uh, honestly, I haven't been able to get a straight answer from anybody on that question. So personally, I, if, it's, if, it's, if you're using tape, like uh, when you got your foil tape, you get that little piece of plastic, which is like a trowel. Is that what it is? Couldn't tell you. Okay, now here's a great question that just came out. Someone brought to me. What pattern development is used for a round collar. Well, what's a round collar? When you lay it out, it's just a strip of metal. So it's simple or straight line. But while we're on the subject, if you were gonna lay out a cone flashing, what kind of pattern development would you use? Radial line. If you were gonna lay out a square round, what kind of, uh, tr what would you use? Triangulation. Those are all possible questions on the CFQ. So please know what your Four types of pattern development. Simple and straight line, parallel line, radial line, and triangulation. And they, these questions occasionally pop up. Uh, when you are trying to, here's another question. When you are trying to make exposed ductwork more appealing, what would you do? Now, there's four possible answers. Duct seal the inside, pre-cut all S and drive, install according to SmackDown. Well, install a coordinate smack that isn't going to make it look any better. Pre-cut all S and drive. Well, you should be doing that anyways. So that's not going to make it. So the best was follow the lines of the building and or duct seal the inside. Me personally, I would duct seal the inside, but that's a pain in the ass too. Right? Follow the lines of the building. Whatever line or whatever wall you're using, follow that line and stay square to it or parallel to it. Right? But again, dumb questions come up. Okay, there is a, here's a safety question. There is a near miss with a scissor lift. What do you do? Now, all four answers, two of the answers talk about telling your supervisor, two of the answers talk about telling the general contractor. We do not deal with the general contractor, we deal with our supervisor. So you've got two, two possibilities. Tell your supervisor and talk at next safety meeting or fear, fill out a near miss report with your supervisor. Honestly, both are right. <laughs> this is what's so stupid about this question. So to fill out the near miss report, if your company does that with your supervisor immediately, uh, although I will say, tell your supervisor and talk at next safety meeting. That's also a possibility, but fill out a near miss report if it is really a near miss or what some people call a near hit, if you wanna be sarcastic about this and okay that's those ones okay some basic ones from uh, these are basic ones from my practice test for you guys that don't have my practice test what flux would you use when soldering galvanized eaves trough comes up all the time Murac muratic acid where is a blast gate used in a blowpipe system the dust collector it's the little thing you pull in and out pull. What is installed every time a commercial kitchen exhaust changes duct, direct, duct changes direction? A clean out. How do, you, uh, how do you waterproof a parapet wall? Well, the top of a parapet wall is the coping or cap flashing. 
The bottom of that wall is a counter flashing, right? There's a lot of different answers to it. Here's another one. What direction should a gooseneck be pointed? Away from prevailing winds. And let's see, what two seams would you use to put together a squared around? You're making a squared around in two pieces. So A, you've got a collar on it, the round end, so you need an elbow edge for that. And you would put the two pieces of the body together with a groove seam. So groove seam and elbow edge. And that's stuff you should try to remember. What is the center line radius of a blowpipe elbow? Two and a half times the width. The blowpipe elbow being a dust collector. What is the center line radius of an HVAC elbow? One and a half times the width of duct. How do you protect... Oh, these are safety questions, so I'm going to skip that because that, well, that was lesson number one. Okay, what is cleaning solution composed of? Sal ammoniac and water. Do, 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 did that one, did that one, because a lot of these ones you've already, you guys already did with all the pattern and stretch out. How do you permanently seal a copper roof? Well, it's not fucking silicone, it's solder. Just think of like a plumbing, your copper plumbing pipe. How do you permanently seal that? Solder. Okay, got some more Soka Toe on there. What else do we have here? Safety, safety. Order of operations for lagging a piece of duct. I may have mentioned this one before, but it's, uh, or I may not have. So, lagging a piece of duct. Here's, you're looking at a piece of duct. You're gonna put insulation on it. Then you're gonna cover it with aluminum, the old way, right? So lagging is the metal protection around that insulation. So it's bottom, there's the piece of metal sides and the top which is like a cat fly this this is almost like doing a parapet wall but it's not so the bottom the sides that cover the, the piece that comes up there and then the top bottom sides top seal all right order of operations which metal has the highest melting point just think about what's the toughest metal you got stainless steel or steel you guys that's a question that pops up all the time which no one ever knows here's another dumb question you are setting up an existing thermostat and you hear a beep what do you need to do well first of all it's a thermostat you're setting it up it's something that a house a homeowner is going to use right so this is here I'm going to give you a thinking question right so let's just take the take two seconds here I'm gonna write this down so you can actually look at this right change the motor pulley so you hear the thermostat beep and is it telling you to change the motor pulley is it telling you to change the RPM is it telling you what else do, oh is it telling you to increase the CFM or is it telling you to change the filter? Now, I think it's pretty obvious. Like I always say to you guys, if you don't get that one, grab yourself a broom and a dustpan because you're losing it, bro. Like if you hear a beep on your thermostat, of course it's changed the filter because a homeowner couldn't change a motor pulley or a C change CFM or RPM, right? These are the kind of things. You guys should be able to think for yourselves on these questions, right? Like the first thing, a rooftop unit is not working properly. So it's not power because it's working. If it wasn't working at all, you would check the power. The first thing you ever check on any rooftop unit or air handling device is the filter because it's always clogged because nobody does in this effing world Nobody does maintenance properly. Not even service companies. They don't give a fuck. They just want your money. All right. Um, oh, yeah. Which model? We just did that. What is the angle of a cold chisel? This is a funny one because I get two different answers. 60 or 70 degrees. So the one school I deal with right now is saying 70, 70 degrees for the cold chisel. So we'll stick with that. 
Although some schools say 60. Crazy. Okay, okay, what lens shade would you use for cutting oxyacetylene? So that's your torch. Foot number five. And if you're using MIG, TIG, or stick welding, where you get a nice bright arc, 10 to 12. Okay. Oh, here's another great, oh, this is a great one. I might have already talked about this. Yes, I did in the last video. Sloping vent pipe for uh, a gas fireplace or any gas appliance. Always slope small end back towards the unit so that condensation can be picked up or burned off. Uh, fusible link did that, 165. Okay, if you're, your drill bits. Here's ones you guys should know from school. But if you didn't go to school, then this is fucking video is perfect. Your regular galvanized mild steel or your jobber bit is 118 degrees. But if you've got to uh, drill into stainless steel, 135 degrees. Okay. On a throatless shear, what happens if the gap is too close? Here's one of those dumb questions where they, oh, on a throatless shear. Throatless shear is meaningless. It's a shear. Think about your snips. What happens if the gap is too close? If the gap is too close, you're gonna bind and cause damage. If the gap is too loose, you're gonna leave a burr. Okay, so things like that you gotta think of. And they, those questions still pop up on the CFQ. Dumb questions, but they gotta fill 120 questions somehow with stupid shit. What two metals corrode uh, the quickest due to galvanic reaction or electrolysis. Um, copper and aluminum. Now there's a there's a funny saying that tells you if you started aluminum, a da 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 tells you all. But aluminum and copper are the two most dissimilar metals. Okay, so that's uh, what matters. Determine X. We don't know. Oh, safety question. We did that one already. Considering expansion and contraction. What is the best roof seam to use? That would be the batten seam. And we're gonna draw that, so because that's a question. Do you recognize the batten seam? Now this is, this is a huge, like sometimes they'll say that there's like a little piece of wood or a spacer in there. But then basically, it's generally, that's a batten seam. Like there's gonna be a little, there's gonna be a hook there and a hook there and a hook there and a hook there. So batten seam. Expansion and contraction. What's the first thing you put down are the cleats. How do you make sure this is straight when you're doing long runs of it? Chalk line. Okay, and those are all possible questions. But now one that they're throwing in there is the bend. So they'll say, they'll go one, two, three, and four, and they'll say, which, one, which, which bends do you do first? Always remember with bend sequences, the smallest like if you've got something like, we'll do something like this. We'll go like this, like a little bend like that, a little bend like that, and then like that. Those two bends right there have to be done first. One and two, or one and two, and then these ones can all be done last. Smallest to largest bends. And then once you look at how they write the sequence, it's obvious. You might have two to choose from. And again, this gets you back to the thinking part of these questions and I'll, we're going to practice a little bit more about that on thinking. You've got four questions. Two of them are absolute, not always, but two of them are all always almost really dumb answers. You get rid of those right away and that leaves you a 50-50 chance of answering it if you don't get it, which is possible. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, what is the setback distance on a brake for 22 gauge and up. I've, and I see lots of different things written, but I'm going one and a half times metal thickness. Okay, and there's the roof seam. Whoa, that's weird. Do, 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 do. What is oh. oh, we've already done pattern stuff. Okay, what determines the metal thickness of a blowpipe duct. Blowpipe duct, material handler, dust collector, right? It's going to be the velocity of that material. It's not the weight because it might not be going that fast. 
But if you've got stuff going super fast, uh, like soybeans, dried soybeans, that stuff going at 3,000 feet per minute can wear down a piece of plate steel in a year, right? I think I talked about that in another uh, lesson. Uh, symbols, did we talk about symbols? Um, like tox other toxic effects, it's the uh, T like that with a star, no, there, that's it. Other toxic effects. You guys should know your Wemis symbols, right? Am I still working here? Yeah, just wanna make sure I'm still running, sorry. Um, and crane signals, have we talked about crane signals? Let's talk about that for a second. I'm gonna, most of you guys should know your crane signals, but we're gonna talk about the basics, right? Line up or load up. So your finger up or finger down is line, the, the cable. The thumb up or thumb down is the boom, right? The, I can, so here's, I don't know if you can see that. Boom out, boom in. Line up, line down. So thumb up, boom up, which is the, the whole arm, right? Boom down, and then line down, or like you can do it like that, you know, line down slow, right? Line up, so that's the cable. And again, boom in, boom out, right? Where the thing slides in and out of the arm. Doesn't come up all the time, but it does come up occasionally. So, let me take a, I'm gonna take a pause for a second to uh, have a drink of beer. My throat's killing me. Okay, I'm gonna have to change my battery here soon. Those are terrible drawings. It's a hollow mandrel, and the bottom one is kind of like a blowhorn, but that looks terrible. Let me try to redraw it so it's like, like that. And <laughs> something like that, like, I don't know. My, you guys know I'm, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, so there's a blowhorn. That one pops up on the C of Q. And there's a hollow mandrel. Not the greatest, but that's all I could download from the, the interweb. Okay, I wanted to show you those two. So you should be able to recognize those. Okay, here's another good question that just came up re recently. Let me wipe this off. About, you're doing a startup and on a, on a, obviously on an air handling unit and there's insufficient CFM. So basically, the CFM is too low. CFM is too low, but the RPM is good. So basically your motor's running good, but you're not getting enough CFM. So they say, add a return air, uh, change the motor, I'm just gonna write motor, change the fan pulley, and increase duct size. Increase duct. Now, you've got, again, like in some cases, sometimes all these, okay, first of all, the RPMs are perfect, right? So do you think you should be changing the motor? No. Okay. Now, increase duct size after you've already, basically, if you haven't put the right size duct, like on your drawings, then you've got issues. So that one's, hmm, okay. Add a return air, adding a return air. Hey, again, if you didn't make stuff the right size, if you didn't put the things in the right proper way, then you've got a problem because then you're not installing stuff properly. But fan pulley is basically your fan pulley, and we've talked about this before, fan pulley or motor pulley, which is how your air balancer, the engineer, your air, well, our air balancer, like 
our guy that comes in at the end of the job, starts up the unit, sees, checks how much air is coming from each duct, and says, okay, we're not getting enough. The first thing they all, the big joke is, turn up the fan speed. Not the motor speed, because it's the fan speed. Because here's your motor pulley, here's your fan pulley, right? Unless, of course, it's direct drive, but it's still the same thing. You just go into the controls and go do, 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 and turn up the fan speed and get it at a, at a new uh, speed. But the normal way, or on most, if on a rooftop unit especially, you open it up and look, there's the motor pulley and there's the fan pulley. You're always supposed to change the motor pulley. You increase the motor pulley and it gives you more CFM. But sometimes, as my air balancer says, Sometimes you can't even get to the damn thing because it's jammed in there. So you increase your, or you change the fan pulley. But remember this, increasing the motor pulley gives you more CFM. But if you increase the fan pulley, it actually goes slower. So yeah, if it's, so you actually have to make the fan pulley smaller to make it go faster. But it's not even saying that anyways. It just says change fan pulley, right? So that's what it'll be. Because it's easy. Just changing a put, you know, a twenty dollar part. Boom, you got you got more air, right? So that's a question. It's a bit of it's like I said. It's a thinking question. But hey, if you get the exact question, you got nothing to think about, right? Increase pulley or change or change pulley size, right? Do do do. <coughs> okay. Here we go, we're going to talk about metals for a minute. Stainless steel, you're about to weld it. What do you do? You grind it to clean away um, impurities, right? What do you do when you're done welding stainless steel? You grind it, but you also buff it to make it look nice, right? So here's a possible question that used to pop up. Oh, you've got... You just finished welding a stainless steel hood for a kitchen exhaust. Oh, and you see a little pinhole in it. You stick a piece of gum in there? No, you have to fix it. What do you do? Well, you gotta fucking weld it. So, what do you do if you're gonna weld it? You're gonna grind it to prep it for welding. Then you're gonna tack, like you're gonna make, well, you're probably gonna TIG weld it, but that doesn't matter. Just put a little spot of weld, fill that hole. Now you filled it. Now you grind it again, make it look nice, and then you buff it. Polish it up, make it look nice, right? Just, so that's stainless steel. Now, black iron. So after you've done, well, after you're done welding black iron, how do you protect it from rusting? You sandblast and paint. Now does anybody really sandblast it and paint it? Probably not, but you should, because, or it, it will rust, right? And it's right in the paperwork. If you go through your basic notes, for metallurgy, it's or well, it's right there. So, sandblast and paint for 16 gauge black iron for uh, kitchen exhaust, commercial kitchen exhaust, and then something as simple as galvanized sheet metal. Well, do we weld galvanized sheet metal? Sometimes you tack weld it for making stuff, but how do you protect that? All you do is paint it, but you paint it with zinc rich paint like Tremclad, it's zinc rich. Right? That's what galvanizing is. It's zinc. It's a zinc wash that they fire it over it when they're making it. Right? And that's uh, about it for metallurgy right now. We might come back to some other stuff after I see some notes. When cutting a hole in painted metal. Okay, here's the trick. Painted metal. Not just metal. Painted metal. What can't you use? Sawzall, snips, hole saw, or plasma. Well, of course it's the plasma. If the, pl if the metal's not clean, the plasma's not gonna make good contact. Okay? Oh, after lagging duct. Remember we talked about lagging duct? So if you're putting insulation and lagging around duct, what's the best way to secure it? Well, first of all, it has to be mechanically secured, and tape is not that. So stainless steel gear clamps. Right? Or like, or the strapping, where you use the strapping thing and you put the clips on it. But stainless steel gear clamps. And I'm telling you, I've walked through uh, commercial jobs where you see the gear clamps down 200 feet of wrapped duct and it's like, oh my God, did that just cost a lot of money. But 
Remember that the C of Q is not about saving money. It's about doing the best proper job you can do when installing stuff. It's like don't, whatever your boss says, it's the exact opposite because he's trying to do it the cheapest and fastest way, right? Just get, remember that, right? It's not about fast. It's about the best way possible, right? So, <laughs> uh, de -de -de. oh, hanger spacing, we've done all that. What happens to a stack of sheet metal when exposed to moisture? One of these dumb trick questions, it sticks together, right? Where should climate control be placed to ensure proper measurements? I might have mentioned this before with, with the furnace questions, but it's on the return air or before the coil, right? If like your climate control is your T-stat, your thermostat, and you never put it near the exterior walls, it always goes in the center of the house or center of the office or whatever fucking room you're in. So where all the return air is going back to the unit, whether it's in the floor or in the ceiling, right? You don't want it near your supplies. Pretty straightforward, right? What is the most likely reason for a coil to freeze up? Not enough air going over it. We, I think we've talked about that, which means usually dirty filter. Here's a nice trick question. In a blow through system using a direct expansion evaporation coil, where do you install the fan? Well, and think about your furnace. You got your furnace, you got your plenum, you got your A-frame coil right there. Where's the fan? Down here, blowing through. It's a fancy word for a furnace. <laughs> Blow through system, all right? How do you secure flex to an HRV? Now, most guys put a little, I can tape, some screws in it, but your HRV has proper little tie straps. Uh, those are like what the electricians use. And then you can actually get like a little, little hand thing that tightens it really well. That's the proper way of putting those on. Because a lot of guys will put a screw in that and, and stop the damper from going, you know, to freeze that up. Uh, doo -doo. Excuse me for a second here. Give your pen a rest there for a minute. Oh! No, I talked about that one already. And I talked about that one already. Oh, to avoid welding stain, to avoid warping when welding stainless steel. Now again, this is one of those questions. This question came a couple of years ago. Uh, warping stainless steel. Okay, so you're welding it. If you do a continuous weld on stainless steel, it'll just get so hot, it just buckles everywhere. So, this is a this is a, a thinking question I want you guys to think about. So, one answer was insole. Uh, sorry. One answer was a lead block. One answer was a brick. And one answer is a chilled copper block, a block of copper. Now, insulation, well anyways, the idea is you're trying to pull the heat out of it. Like, the first, when, when this first question used to come out, this was never one of the answers. It used to be clamp. Tack well, like you would tack around, say if you're doing something around, you would do little tacks and then a little bit in between. That's the proper way of doing it, but now they gotta change it to complicate things. So this is a question about thinking. So what do any of these do? Well, a lead block or a brick, they will pull heat out of it to keep it cooler. The insulation will just make it hotter, so that's not gonna help at all. But you want to talk about doing everything the most expensive way? A chilled copper block? You know, you got to go keep, keep that in a fridge and then go put it... Well, it's going to work the best to keep your stainless steel cooler. Absolutely dumb question. Because, again, how much welding do we do? And this is pretty technical stuff they're talking about. So, again, hey, if you're a teacher that did this, go ahead, punch yourself in the face. Because you deserve it. Stupid assholes. Okay.
Uh, do, do, do. Oh, what do you attach? How do you attach a fire damper to its sleeve? Number 10 screws. Just remember that. Number 10 screws. If, oh, this is a layout question. I probably did that with you earlier. Layout question, layout question, layout question. Mm, fuck. I might be able to get out of this thing first. Oh, order of operations for installing a 3D sign. It's, uh, it's a question that's on the practice test. If you guys have ever been to the, the Red Seal website, there's 20 uh, practice CFQ questions, which some of them still come on. They, hey, it teaches you how to answer some questions too. The Red Seal website. Uh, it's hard to find sometimes unless you put exactly red dash seal in dot ca uh, doo -doo -doo. order of operations for a 3d sign so here's the wall so install the anchors so it's always the anchors in the back of the wall so basically the answer is the back the sides and the front because it kind of makes sense obviously if you're putting the side you can't you can't do the front because then that's in the way of doing the back. So there's the back, the sides, or the sides like that, the front. Anchors, back, sides, front. Another not so uh, fun question. It's kind of, I don't know if you can see that. Hopefully you can. I guess I'll see when I play this back. What metal cutting device punches out crescent shaped pieces? The nibbler. Okay, so that's that's it for that one. Let me take a break, have a sip of beer, some thinking juice. I'll get back to you. All right, guys, um, we're gonna go over a couple of questions about dust collection systems. I know people are getting some questions that are just crazy. Now, order of operations. Now, again, there's two types. There's negative pressure and positive pressure. So positive pressure, the fan is pulling from the shop or whatever it's pulling from, and it blows it into the cyclone, and then from there it goes into the bag house, and then, oh, and then of course, after the bag house, you're gonna have a vent at the top here, and that is gonna be clean air, right? And what it goes at clean air? The HRV. Right, so that's a, like that. That question's popping up a lot now, but um, you might wonder. Now I'm going to give you a little picture. You can draw that, or just pause that. I don't know if you can see that. Depending on which way, you, but see, I marked that. There's it all pulling from this, the building, the shop, fan, blowing into the cyclone, and then after the cyclone is a uh, bag house and then after the bag house where the clean air comes out that's going to be the hrv so now give me two seconds to wipe this board down because basically you guys can just pause that and another question that's coming up is uh explosion explosion relief vent so they're saying positive side or negative side of the duct or top or bottom of the duct. Now I've, I've, I've had two different answers from two different teachers, right? Okay, so the teacher that I'm taking it from is gonna be, I'm taking, I'm, because I have to choose one from somebody because you can't get this out of a textbook. So, positive top side of duct. Positive top side. Positive pressure, top side of duct. Wait a minute, oh no. Thanks to uh, David, they've changed the question again. Because it can come to, instead of, so your choices are positive or negative duct, okay? So that's straightforward, right? And top or bottom of duct, right? So we're gonna say positive and top of duct. But now they're gonna say, positive or negative, or the bottom or the side of a cyclone. 
Now here's the kicker. I went to one of these websites that shows all this equipment and the only place I saw an explosion relief vent on anything was on this. It did, they didn't talk about positive or negative. They just said it was on the side. So on the side of a cyclone, here I'll even give you a, a picture. Give me two seconds to pull it out of my binder. So there's, and that comes from Local 30. I don't know if you can see that because it's so dark in here. There, there's some better light. If I turn this light sideways here, so you guys get, you can see that a little bit better if you close. Hopefully you're not watching this on a phone. You better not be. You got this on a computer screen. Let's see how light on that is. So there's your picture. It's the best I can do for it. Sorry. <laughs> um, but on the side of that site, I'm looking at this thing right now. There's the side of a cyclone, pre-cleaning baffle, lower cone, nothing on it. So where they're getting this information to ask it, I don't know because I don't know anybody who's ever been taught this stuff in school. And if you have, please send me a, leave me a message on the comment part, please. And I appreciate everybody's comments, please. Because uh, if there's anything that helps the next guy, uh, even questions because you guys see my phone number up there my email address if you guys can get a hold of me find me on Facebook Jason Morris you know GTA Toronto area uh, that way you can send and ask dumb questions like because some of the CFQ questions that are coming out are ridiculous like uh, like you got to be a freaking genius to figure it out right like and I certainly ain't no fucking genius so uh, Let's all work together, please. Okay, let me find some more questions here. Oh, yes. When cutting drywall without knowing obstructions. So you got four answers. Sawzall. What was it? Sawzall, hacksaw, hole saw, or a utility knife. I think we all agree that it's a utility knife because you can set your utility knife at half an inch and just cut the drywall. And you won't go through. You can just... Kind of common sense, but not necessarily. Okay, here's one, somebody wrote one. How do you control air volume in a duct? Well, somebody over here wrote opposed blade damper. Now, an opposed blade damper, you will be able to control in a duct. But do we, is that where we use them? Opposed blade dampers are usually on our supply air grills, right? Let's talk about this. Let me get rid of this. An opposed blade damper. Do you even know what a opposed blade is? It's the volume damper that looks like that. That is on your supply air grill. You put a screwdriver in here, twist it, so this can be partially open, you know, partially closed. Like, you know, it's not just open or closed, right? So, what do you use in a duct? Well, most ducts are like a branch like that. And what do you use? You're going to use a splitter damper, right? Splitter damper. Volume damper is another one for a duct, right? Like a single blade damper. That's going to... So you got to... When you read a question, make sure you read all four answers and put a little bit of thought to it, right? Because they're, they're trying to make you think for yourself, which, again, nobody was made to do in school. You're just like, here's the thing, regurgitate it. Here's something regurgitate it right to, like making people think for themselves is, is like you know it's not it's not human rights anymore oh I gotta think for myself oh it's not right you know uh, anyways Wrin oh here is that one wrinkles after lagging duct how do you smooth out whatever you're lagging it with because used to, we like our company has somebody come in and they put that heavy foil wrap on it sticky on one side and it, and I am going to say it's a trowel I think it's a trowel anyways so polish and buff that's the D to D how do you smoke uh, see some of these questions people write me down lots of questions and they scribble stuff and sometimes it's just kind of crazy okay here's a question that's been out there for years and it keeps coming up you're in a vestibule and you open the door and the ceiling tile pops up. And every, all, half of most of these cheat sheets, 
Some teacher has said increase the supply air, and it's not that. Please don't put increasing supply air is not going to stop a ceiling tile from popping up. It's going to make it pop up. It's going to help it to pop up. So let's talk about negative pressures. A little quick one for two, two different questions. Okay, here's a plan view of a restaurant. There's the kitchen. There's the restaurant. There's the vestibule. So we're going to talk about a couple different things. So this door swings open, ceiling tile pops up. It means you need a, a relief damper, which no one even is heard of anymore, or a transfer button, a way to transfer the air out of there. So when you push that door open, it pressurizes the little room and the ceiling tile pops up. So A, there's probably no supply, there's probably nothing in there for heating except for an electric heater. But there should be an air transfer or an air relief duct. Because that's another one of those questions. If there's if the, if some teacher actually made this question up and put it on the CFQ and the answer was supply air duct, if you're that teacher, punch yourself in the face. Alright, now the restaurant. Here's a question that comes up. There's your double doors. You're swinging doors from the restaurant going into the kitchen. Here's your grill. What's above the grill? The uh, kitchen exhaust. So, what happens is there's a smoke alarm here. It keeps going off. Or, there's a table here and you can smell the fucking curry. <laughs> I don't mind curry, but say you're sitting at the table, I, I can smell curry being cooked. That means the smells from here are coming out here. So if you know how ki commercial kitchen exhaust works, this ductwork goes up to the roof. But there's another vent right here, which is make up air. So fresh air is being drawn, brought in so it can go up here and not suck cool um, air conditioning from here or heat from here. So if this fan is exhausting at 1100 CFM, this makeup air can only bring in a thousand. So the answer on that question will be smoke alarm is going off or you can smell the food being cooked out in the restaurant. What's the problem? How do you correct it? Increase exhaust, decrease makeup air. So up, this one down, right? And this one where you open the door and the ceiling tile pops up, it's not it's definitely not um, uh, supply air, increased supply air. It's some form of either relief damper or out of transfer duct, right? Just to, so when you open the door, the pressure relieves. Okay, let's see what else is on this sheet somebody gave me. Sequence of cleaning electronic air, um, de-energize, take out pre-filter, cells clean, reassemble. Again, that's one of those step-by-step -step things that you shouldn't have if you take your time with it, you shouldn't have, uh, have a problem with it. Uh, again, these guys are writing stuff down that I can't understand what they're saying. Maybe I'll have to take... Uh, oh! Oh, here's a great one. It's a new question coming up. But if you guys ever use caddy clamps, or I don't know if you know what a caddy clamp is. But here's, for especially for you guys that do commercial, or in ICI. So here is an I-beam, right? And then on your I-beams, then you're going to have, well, your corrugated roof decking, and then and or whatever. So a caddy clip is one of those little C-clamps that, that uh, clamps on, and then you hang a rod from it. So a lot of you guys didn't know this, and I didn't know this either, but you can't hang that from the bottom of that. An I-beam or a truss, it might not, not just a truss, sorry. The, I don't know if you guys know what a truss looks like. It's kind of like that, but it's got that big, like, like that in it. You'll see that in schools and stuff like that. Usually that's about 16, 24 inches, depending on the build, how big the building is. You cannot hang a caddy clamp from the bottom of that. You're pulling it down. The weight is all meant to sit on the top of that. That caddy clamp has to sit up here in between that, between the corrugated metal. 
And you're thinking, fuck that, I've hung it from there tons of times. Yes, we've all hung it from there tons of times. Is it, is it allowed? No. And the only reason I knew that was because an engineer came to us after we did it, most of, half of a school job, and we had to pull them all fucking down. Cocksucker. Sorry, pardon my language. Right? So, again, these questions are about doing everything the best way possible and the right way. Not the way that our bosses make us do it. Okay? So that's... Uh, Okay, I'm going to uh, I'm going to take another uh, pause for a beer and uh, I'll get back to you. My throat's killing me, man. Okay, um, here's a few upstream, downstream. I'm pretty sure I talked about that in the last uh, video. If you, if you're looking at your furnace and if you're at the fan, the filter is upstream. Like what? It's just like standing in front of a river. You throw your cigarette butt in the river, it goes downstream, not up. Upstream is against the current. So try to remember that. Okay, so I see what somebody wrote down here, the, 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 MRI, the MRI lab thing, somebody wrote nylon, and that, again, nylon's not one of the answers on it. Material used in a pharmaceutical lab, I think I might have talked about this on a previous one, but it's usually stainless. But what they do, is they don't say stainless. Sometimes they'll say that they'll say nickel, and nickel is one of the metals in stainless. So be careful of that being a trick question. How to calculate rivet diameter? Some guy's got two times the rivet. That's not right. So how far should a rivet protrude through the metal? 1.5 times diameter. Now. If you're putting two pieces of metal together, like say you're overlapping two pieces, and how far should that rivet be from the edge of material? That is two times. That is two times the diameter. But most times it's, how far should the head protrude through? One and a half times the diameter. Here's another one that just came up recently. And you guys probably remember this from my other videos. There's a top view of a squared around. How much of this do you need for the uh, to lay it out? You only need a quarter of it because there's four quarters and they're all the same. They've changed it or they've added a new one. So now what they do is they put it to the side like this. So basically now it looks like that. So now it's this side and this side. So this side is a quarter you need and this is a half, half of the pattern because that's the same and that's the same. Okay, There's, that's another good one. Uh, system 636, the white pipe you put on furnace venting. Uh, how, what do you do after cutting? Deburr. Uh, glue, and you, you're, you know, how are you putting it together? Glue, you're probably clean and glue. Like, you, you got, it's, it's pretty basic stuff, you guys should know that. Here's a question that's come up, I don't know if this is the right answer because I'm just putting what's on. How to check the limit switch, obviously the high limit, on a furnace. Now, I thought that would be continuity to see if the thing's working, but this guy's got written here an ohm meter. You know what, when you get into electronics and stuff like that, and that, like I don't have that from, from anybody personally, just from what somebody wrote down, so I'm really not sure. Now, plasma question. How does a plasma save money? It saves on it saves on labor costs, right? Because the machine's cutting it all out. But somebody wrote here, nesting. Well, that's the way the new questions go. So when you're programming the Vul or it used to be the Vulcan program, but we'll just say the plasma, you're putting in the program, how can you make it save metal? Well, there's different ways of programming it. So if you put in 800 fittings and it's gonna use a bunch of metal, if you do it on the what they call the quick think uh, program, where okay, just think, for, think, have the machine computer think about it for two minutes and start cutting pieces, it won't nest as tightly. If you let that, this and again, this is the way I was taught. It was my teacher taught me in school, and hey, the guy was pretty fucking smart. If you let that computer think for 12 hours or 24 hours, it'll re, it'll nest those fittings so that you save. Maybe a fucking extra sheet of metal. So is it worth it to have the computer think? Yes, if you want to save a $20 sheet of metal. 
but basically the best way of saving money is for nesting and the best way the point of the plasma is to save on cost of labor right because for a guy to lay out fittings like it's so much so much longer okay let me dig up some more questions let me let me get up camera. let me dig up some more questions uh, and I'll get back to you okay here's a couple of good questions because these ones are popping up a lot what is the most important part of a rooftop unit startup and the answer here is to remove the shipping blocks so there's another question like the startup is remove shipping blocks but what is needed on a rooftop uh, or like a, uh, a startup is a startup report so there's the paperwork part and then there's the thing, remove the shipping box it's every, because everything's tied down on the inside and you'll destroy the unit. And order of operations for acoustical insulation. Now this one tricked me because back in the day when I used to do it for my old man, he was a cheap fuck. He didn't, he just have a box of pins with a, with a uh, peel off the plastic and stick the pins. Whereas now I don't know if that's right because I don't know. So I'm having this argument with people because some guys are saying, oh, glue pin. But no, I think it's the, even if you're doing it that way, because you're going to weld the pins on. So you're going to have your duct. You're going to zap your pin, like even if it's the welders, zap your pins on or peel a sticky off, put your pins on. Then you're going to brush your glue on. Then you're going to put your insulation on, right? And then you're going to put the little clips that hold the insulation down. So for that, and you write it down as I'm talking, it's going to be pins, glue, insulation, clips. Okay, that's just one more I just want to go over quickly. And I'm going to stop again because I'm just digging up some good material here for you. Okay, uh, where are we? Okay, I wrote a bunch of stuff on the board here that we're gonna go through. Okay, I don't know if you guys remember seeing this. This is an open chute. And they used to ask you how much material you need to make that. Now they've added more questions to this. So you see this is made out of one piece of metal. So when you fold this part this way, this opens up. And when you fold that together, these, these pieces overlap each other. So they'll call this A, B, C, and D and they'll say which ones need patching and which ones are overlapping uh, for that one. And also, they just added a new one to this chute question. They're going to say you're, in, uh, you're using an open chute to move grain. So what's going to make that grain go through that chute faster? Well, it's an open chute. There's no fan on it. So the only thing that's going to make grain go down that, that chute faster is either gravity or a higher angle and another word for angle is rake like like raking leaves same thing with a shear um, if you're using uh, like your shear whether it's a the foot one or a power shear if if the uh, the shear blade is flat like that it won't cut the more you increase the angle the better it cuts through also on a what they call a squaring shear when this blade is pushing down, it pushes the metal to one side to make sure it's square. And it always pushes to the left. So remember that. Like, and if you guys have to write this stuff, pause and continue to write down. Here's another little thing. That's a chop saw. That is how angle... Okay, the chop saw. Oh, shit. Hold on. I fix this. Hello, governor. There we go. Oh, no, that's not it either. Okay, here we go. The chop saw. That's a picture of a chop saw. Not very good, but that's a piece of angle under it. This that's, these stupid questions still pop up occasionally, but that's how it's supposed to sit directly under the center of the, uh, the blade. And then there's another older question still pops up, but they show you a piece of wood like this, and it's on two sawhorses. And they, they give you a bunch of lines of where it should be cut. And it should be cut here so that this piece falls away. If you cut here in the middle, 
it's going to tip together and bind. Don't, like, well, they're not totally dumb questions, but um, they're, they're not there as much anymore. So, but they do still show up. Okay, what do I got here for reminders? I got a bunch of stuff written here for reminders. Blanking. Uh, blanking is when you take, uh, hold on, I gotta find what the, blanking is when you take, oh, there it is. The, the exact question is, which of the following shear operations cuts out a shape out of raw stock or coil strip? And it's called blanking. A question that it still pops up occasionally, so I wanted to go over that. Okay, builder's level. So there's a new question that's popping up, and it's still kind of a contention, like it's where some of us are still debating it. On you've got two foot by two foot panels, and do they have to be at a certain elevation? Right? All right, let's try this one again. Uh, battery in my camera just died, and when I say died, it like went kaputski. Had to go to fucking Amazon and order new batteries, and they came in. Ordered batteries on Amazon last night, and they came, and I picked them up in 18 hours. Less than 24 hours. I ordered it last night at 6, and I was getting a call at 12, 1 today at work to come pick them up from the post office. That's insane. It's insanity. It's crazy shit. Anyways, okay. What were we talking about? The builder's level, you're going to do two foot by two foot panels. And you have to put them at a certain elevation, right? At a certain height. Uh, a plumb bob is for a straight line up and down. A chalk line is just for making th sure things are straight, right? So that leaves you a four foot level and a builder's level. So a four foot level will tell you that that's level, but a builder's level, which for you guys that don't know what a builder's level is, if you're, when you're we're doing high rise, especially uh, the foreman guys, the concrete guys, there's always a guy with the tripod and that little thing he's looking through. He's, he's setting heights. Like usually they have like little triangles drawn around called benchmarks and they transfer those around. And I, I have no idea how the fuck it works, but that's the idea. So a builder's level will be able to tell you exactly what level that is. Now, there's <laughs> just within the last day, some people brought me more questions. Uh, here's a great one. Do you know what that is? That's a return air. What is that? That's supply air. So the question on the CFU goes, what side of this return air duct is facing the supply air? And you got north, south, west, and east. So the thing is, if you got, for you guys that look at drawings all the time, you will notice that pretty well all the time when you look at a drawing and it's in front of you, what is north? Like 100% of the time or it's just a little bit off, right? That's, north is always that way. So if that's north, that's south. South is facing that part of the duct. It's pretty simple, but the way they word it, and they, it, it can be very tricky, right? So write that down so you don't forget that one. Now, here's one. I'm just re getting rid of that stuff, so I... Oh. oh, hold on. Oh. Guy's not showing up for tutoring. Can't help those guys. <laughs> Alright, B vent. Now, hopefully you guys know what A vent and B vent and C vent. A and B vent is a double-walled uh, pipe. Like one has insulation in the middle of the double wall and one has just an air pocket. And then C vent is just heavy gauge stove pipe, right? Oh, sorry, now they have Z vent, which is stainless steel. But that's another fucking disaster of a question coming up. Actually, I got it marked here. So, gas appliances. I can't stress this enough. The crimped end always, like, if, again, if you're doing C vent, just heavy gauge pipe. It goes, slopes back towards the gas appliance so the condensation running back will burn off or go to the condensate pump, as in a furnace. Uh, but be careful in the wording because I, I just got the one where 
you've got B vent, B vent going up through a roof, right? So I don't know if, you, uh, if you've ever done that, which is usually commercial, but you can do it on residential. But here's your flat roof. And before the roof, you're gonna put down a cone flashing, right? Cone flashing. And then the, the roofers are gonna roof over that and waterproof it. Then you're gonna come along and you're gonna, because you always stick it up through, you're gonna stick up through a B vent. Now, if you guys have ever worked with B vent, it's a double wall and you don't screw it. Every piece locks together. It, like a, it's, it's, it's made in pieces, it all locks together. And then when you put that B vent through, nice, it'll be nice and tight there. You put a little bit of sealing around there. You can even put a fucking storm collar around it. So right there is your B vent. Now, what's gonna go on top of that? Your little china cap. If that's fucking politically correct. Your rain cap, sorry. Fucking, <laughs> and that, normally if it was just a piece of pipe, you would just screw it on. But if that's B vent, that actually locks on, right? And some guys will actually put a little tiny screw in there, but you shouldn't, but people do. You put a little tiny screw in. So, again, what are you gonna put up there? Well, that's the male end. They're gonna ask you male end, female end, they're gonna ask you some other stupid shit, but that's how it goes for that. But don't get tricked in, like it always, cause when, if, if your boiler is down here and you've got crimp pipe coming back here, this should always be sloping down towards the unit. So you gotta be careful in the wording, cause these, these guys, like the more I hear and see questions over the last few years, the more questions I see that are just, just ignorant. And you know what I say for people putting those questions on the CFQ, punch yourself in the face. Okay, now here's another one. Corrugated roof decking. I'm sure you've all cut through this with a sawzall or get the saw out, ah, cut this motherfucker, put your draw a curb around it, put a drop for a rooftop unit. So, they're gonna tell you that that's four inches. They're gonna tell you maybe that it's an inch high. And they're gonna tell you that that is an inch like going in that direction. So obviously, if it's an inch up, and an inch over, you're going to use Pythagoras to figure that out. Most likely, as long as that's 45 degrees, and I'm sure it is 45 degrees. If it's an inch up, an inch down, that's a 45 degree angle. And if not, either way, you're going to use Pythagoras, A squared plus B squared, square rooted, that's how the fucking thing goes. Okay, that will give you that, and then they'll say, what's the stretch out of that piece? Pretty straightforward. But I want to just touch on that before. Um, oh, sorry. And now I want to touch on another one. For you guys doing Sokotoa, you guys will recognize this question where I give you that 30 degrees, 24 inches, 8 feet. Look familiar? And they want to figure out X. Well, guess what? Watch how we go through this without drawing the picture. Because this is how, this is where you guys gotta learn to think for yourselves. They're not gonna give you the picture. They're gonna say, hmm, you've got a fucking hanger. It's such, it's so long. And it's attached to a sloped roof. Hmm. So hold on, there's a sloped roof. The sloped roof is 30 degrees. Oh, 30 degrees, hmm, okay. And wait a minute, the first hanger away from there is 24 inches. Okay. And the next hanger is eight feet away. What's the next length of the next hanger? Look familiar? Because I've been showing everybody this question and I've already drawn it out. But they're not always are they going to give you this nice cute picture. They're going to describe it in words. That's where you guys gotta learn how to describe something and draw a picture of it. I remember when I was in like grade four, grade five, the teachers gave us a, a not a marker, but gave us a pencil. Okay, there's a pencil, describe it. And like, we're getting ready to, oh, you can't draw it. You have to describe it. And we're like, yeah, it's a pencil. <laughs> and of course, 
fucking teacher looked at us like we're fucking idiots. All right, anyways, apologize for the swearing voice. Blanking, we did that one, B vent through the roof, did that one. Okay, we'll talk about the B vent again. So, if you guys ever d done mechanical rooms, and I fucking hope you have, if you haven't done mechanical rooms, that's a shame because it's fun, especially if you do good work at the end of the job, you sign your name to it. So, like we always say that, you don't actually sign your name. But if it looks good, you sign your name to it. But if you look and see what the plumbers are using or whoever's doing all the venting for the boilers, it's called Z-Vent because it's really nice stainless steel. Instead of the B-Vent or A-Vent or B-Vent is usually a heavier aluminum or depends on the metal. And then C-Vent is usually just galvanized. But you'll see the Z-Vent. It'll come in pieces all nice and shiny. That's, that's stainless steel at Z-Vent. So again, it's about not what's cheapest, it's what's the best. Anything made out of stainless steel is going to last longer than yours and my life put together, or what's left of them, anyways. Okay, so some of the things just remember Z vent. You ain't get rid of that question. Okay, muriatic acid is for what metal? Galvanized. I knew you knew that. What's phosphoric acid for? Stainless steel. While we're there. Don't be afraid to write that down. These are all those dumb questions I want to go over. Brakes. A normal handbrake. I turn you, I turn this fucking thing around and show you the handbrake and the lock former I got here in my garage. Don't use them much, just occasionally make a fitting for somebody once in a while. Box pan brake or a handbrake? Do you do you remember what the difference is? A normal handbrake is just to do straight bends. The, the box and pan, or some people call it the finger brake. There might be two different, but the idea is so if you want to make a pan or a box, you fold two sides up and then you can spin it and put those two sides in between the fingers and not crush it and fold up these boxes where you can't do that on a normal hand brake. But here's the new twist to the question. What brake would you use to do a coping? A, a coping flashing, which you better fucking know what that is. I've gone over it enough. There, something like that, right? Now that comes in straight pieces. So guess what? You could fold this on a regular brake. You don't have to do it on a box pan brake. All right? So these are those little fucking trick questions that um, we don't, we never go over, right? Okay. Now, talking about, we just talked about B vent and uh, Z vent, uh, basically boiler breaching, quarter inch per foot slope. You better fucking know that. Sorry, I'm getting pissy here. High temp gasket. So, at the back of the boiler, there's the, the vent, you know, and there's going to be a big flange on that for those big boilers, and you're going to tie uh, another pipe to that. What's going to go in there? What's the best thing that you can put in there? A high temp gasket because just, just it helps to stop the carbon monoxide leaking out of there. Like you could just bolt it on, but if you look at all the boilers, they all have gaskets on them. They're usually those red gaskets. Uh, okay, another fucked up question. Kitchen exhaust, commercial kitchen exhaust, right? 16 gauge black iron, right? How, how do you protect it? Sandblast and paint. But with kitchen exhaust, they have a question where is, what kind of sealant are you going to use for it? Well, the, one of the fucking things, one of the first things you see is silicone, and then you'll say, see food grade silicone. And when they say kitchen, people are, oh, food grade, kitchen, fucking light bulb goes on. Eh, wrong again. High temp gasket. We don't give a fuck about food grade. We're not eating us like we're not doing stuff to eat out of, right? The sealant is for the if you are I don't know why the fuck you'd use high temp sealant unless it was on your uh, access door, but uh, the idea is to not get tricked up on that question because they love doing that shit. Okay, noisy return air. If a, if a return air grill is making noise like whistling. Like that, first thing, the air's moving too fast, right? 
So how do you alleviate it? A, slow the air down. Now, but here, here's one of those questions where it's a thinking question. Check all the answers, right? Uh, a, one of the answers could be make the return air bigger, okay? So you might not have slow the air down. Uh, you might, uh, like, checking, like, there could be a damper stuck. Yeah, maybe, right? But if it's sucking, the air mainly, it, it, man, excuse me, I'm babbling now. Air makes noise from the speed of it, right? So uh, there, there's just, again, be careful of what they put in the answer column. Always take the time to read it. Ah, four gauges, shear or break. If you've got a break or a shear and it's rated for 16 gauge mild steel or galvanized, what uh, stainless can you cut with it? Four gauges higher, right? So, and then there's another one, you're using your handbrake and you take off the reinforcing bar on it. What happens? Four gauges higher, kind of like an easy to remember, right? Oh, service question, here we go. <clears throat> Cracked heat, you come in, your customer's complaining about a cracked heat exchanger. Uh, sorry, <laughs> watering, dumb fuck. Uh, it's been a long day at work. Uh, <laughs> cracked heat exchanger is for customers complaining about watering eyes, like his eyes are burning. And it's most likely cracked heat exchanger. His wife's trying to poison him or some fucking thing. All right, okay. Blast gate, okay, this is your order. Now we did this before, but we're gonna do it. I just saw it, just saw it, just saw the question. So, here's your fan, right? Here is your cyclone, where the air is. And then here's your bag house. And then of course, that's where the clean air is coming out. So that's gonna be your HRV. Right, so bag house, uh, cyclone, fan. Oh, well, what comes before the fan? Well, this is coming from where, where the shop. Right here is your uh, main main trunk line, and then all the smaller lines, the the branch lines that go down to the machinery, like say a, a, a planer and you're planing wood or drilling in wood, you're gonna be pulling fucking uh, sawdust up here. So when this comes down to the machine, down to your little piece of pipe there, there's a fucking damper there. Blast gate. So, order of operations. Blast gate, trunk, uh, branch line, trunk line, fan, cyclone, bag house, HRV. Please write that shit down. Because uh, that's coming up a lot now. It's the uh, order of operations. And somebody might say, or another teacher might say, oh, but maybe the fan's at the end. Oh, what, it's a negative pressure system? Well, when the fan's in the middle of that, it's sucking from the shop, and it's blowing it into the cyclone and bagels. That's a positive pressure system. I've never heard of anything other than that. I got my paperwork right there from the local 30 trade school and these guys know what's going on. Why is my fucking thing flashing? Stop that. It's flashing. Oh. Alright. That's uh, a little better there. Okay. Uh, where the f okay, sorry about that interruption there. Okay. Too bright. Mm, pretty bright, eh? Now I'm too dark. All right. A volometer measures the velocity of air. Hmm. Those questions are popping up now occasionally. Draw uh, your vein anemometer. <laughs> Whatever the fuck that is. So the question is, service question, you drop it. How, what do you do? 
So this is one of those tricky questions where one is give it to your supervisor. Okay. One is take it out of service. Eh. Another one is send it away for calibration back to the manufacturer. Just imagine how long that would take. And another one is, which I like, is compare it to a bunch of readings you just did. So if you got, if not, like, if you just did some readings that day or that, that or you were just doing it when you dropped it, you go test exactly where you just tested and hopefully the fans are still running the same way. And say, nah, you know what, it's pretty close. It works and fine, right? Because again, you send the thing out, it's gonna be gone forever. You give it to your supervisor, like what happens over at our company, you give it to the supervisor, something's broken, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll get that taken care of. And he just gives it to the next guy, <laughs> Silvio. <laughs> ah, just kidding, brother. Okay, I'm gonna pause for the cause for a minute, find some more questions to go over. Okay, guys, um, last few questions that I'm gonna squeeze in for now. Okay, here's a really dumb one, but it gets back to thinking. High limit switch on your furnace keeps going off. Now, first of all, why does it go off? Because it's going, it's too hot. High limit means it's the, the switch is getting hot, which is always not enough air going over it, which normally is dirty filter. But there's no dirty filter. Board is broken, nicked wire, faulty stat, faulty uh, transformer so it's not enough air going over it so like so like i just actually i just to uh just got hold of a teacher um now faulty stat and well faulty stat has nothing to do with high limit right all that does is turn on turn off calls for heat doesn't call for heat um uh, faulty transformer well, transformer just powers certain things. It's not, the high limit switch is just a little tiny thing that's just by your heat exchanger and it goes off because it's too hot. So then you've got board is broken and nicked wire. So from the teacher I just talked to, board is broken, very good possibility, but so is a nicked wire. So this is one of those questions that it's disgusting. So, hey, we all know service guys. Write this question down, talk to a service guy and see what he says, right? And then do me a favor, if you get a good answer, uh, put it in the comment section uh, on the YouTube channel, please. Let's all help each other out. Okay, so there's that one. Pause if you have to, to write it down. Okay. Next one, one zone, it's, it's heating season, one zone is colder. Now there's a different type of question, but this is, uh, I talked about before, but this is a different one. One zone is colder. Dirty filter, dirty filter is always the answer, 90% of the time. But one zone is colder. It's not dirty filter. Too many return air, eh, I, highly unlikely. Now what they got over here, motor broken in the zone damper. Well, that makes sense because then this one is grills too far away. You know, if you think about that, that was actually a really easy one. You, you can thank the uh, geniuses up at, uh, well, whoever these guys are. Okay, what is that? It's a standing seam. Don't forget it. What's the allowance for that? Times three, right? So if it's a three quarter inch standing seam, times three. Same with a fish lock collar, times three. Okay, how do we check gas pressure? The YouTube anemometer. And I'm gonna go fucking yell at this dog for a minute. All right, try again. I can chase the dog down the street, you know. Okay. Uh, gas pressure, YouTube anemometer, YouTube anemometer, right? You know the, the YouTube thing, and uh, they don't you don't see this question anymore, but that's zero. So basically, if this is at 1.5, it 
and down here at 2.5. Um, I thought one would minus the other. Supposedly, it actually equals four. <laughs> like that makes any sense. I just saw that in a book somewhere. That was uh, actually it was the local 30 book because they always got good stuff. Okay, forming a weather cap. Oh, you know, China cap. So um, actually, I just had it on a piece of paper. Uh, fuck. It's cut, form spot weld right so it's, it's pretty well the same thing with anything you know depending on what you're doing measure cut form spot weld. you know what i mean like it's pretty straightforward right same with making a piece of one piece wrapper duct right cut notch cross break form lock break <laughs> put the uh the mail of the pittsburgh on it Okay, a saddle or a cricket. It used to be, like, what's that for? It's for the back of a chimney. So here's your chimney. There's your roof line. Yeah, anyways. So, the first piece that goes on is here. The second piece, so base, sides. They call these, so we'll call it base, uh, steps or sides and then here is the saddle oops sorry saddle and then if anything there's gonna be attaching this stuff so they might add more stuff in there like oh nail in and then put a sealant on there or something like that but you know base steps saddle what else do we got here? Oh, okay. Talking about dust collection systems. Your takeoffs are always, when you do a wide branch, it's always on the taper. It's always, here, let me, if you can't see that. So there's your run, there's your taper, there's your duct. So your branch should always be on the taper. That should always be 30 degrees, that angle. Um, this should be 5 to 1 for length. So 5 inches long for every 1 inch in change. So if this was 6 inches round and that was 4 inches round, this would be 10 inches long. Right? 2 inches of change, 5 inches long for each inch of change. Okay, and if the question comes up, these fittings should always be flat on bottom. And what do we mean by that? So there's a side view. That's a round, that's a round fitting, but it should be flat on bottom. Same with this uh, branch coming in, flat on bottom. That way all the fucking crap in here all doesn't end up going down little hills and making stuff wear out. That question doesn't pop up too much, but it occasionally does. Okay, oh, uh, and you're putting a copper, see you're putting a copper fucking hood, and you're uh, uh, bolting it to a wall. A, you should just, even if it's a concrete wall, but you should still put a rubber gasket in behind there, just in case, right? So, rubber gaskets, or you're doing a copper roof on, on top of a galvanized roof, continuous felt strips. Not single strips, but one continuous full coverage. Don't be cheap. Just remember that. Don't be cheap. Like your boss. And you know what? That's it. Okay guys, hopefully this is the end of my video right now. Because I think I've got almost two hours of just awful questions. But these are the kind of questions that keep popping up. So I'm going to remind you guys about math. The only way you get good at it is practicing it, right? Not just looking at it, okay, I did that. You know, things like, simple things like pi r squared backwards, right? If I tell you, a little quick practice it. If I say, okay, there's a square and around. It's 20 by 14. What's the round end? Equal area transition. 
Okay, 20 by 14 equals 280 square inches. Always write your unit of measurement. So, let's see, you guys should be doing this faster than I should be doing. So how do we get that? Pi r squared backwards. Divide by pi squared root times two, yeah. Okay, so divide by pi square root times two. There's the diameter, okay? That's for changing the squared around. Oh, but let's try that one again. Okay, so now you're doing a CVA for it. You got 3,000 CFM. You've got 900 feet per minute, and I want the duct in round. So very quickly, see if you guys can handle this. See if I can find my calculator, which of course I can't. There it is. Okay, maybe you guys have already done this by now. Okay, so the tri CVA triangle. C V A square feet. You guys should know this off by heart. So C is CFM, uh, V is velocity, feet per minute. So what do we got here? 3,000, that goes on top here. 900, right here. What are we gonna do with that? 3,000 divided by 900 equals 3.33 square feet. So how do we change square feet into a diameter of duct? Oh yeah, pi squared backwards. Divide by pi squared root times two. Okay, 3.3 square feet. We want it in square inches times 144 times 144. Boom, 480 square inches in this in this pipe. But wait a minute, I can't call Don Park and say, "Hey, bro, hey, bro, can I get a fucking some spiral? It's 480 square inches." And look, I hang up on me, fucking fucking idiot. All right. Divide by pi, square root times two. All right, divide by pi equals square root equals times two equals, oh, it's 24 inches, 0.7. And of course, you, of course you're gonna order 24, but if 25 is there, you know you gotta take it because you round up. Okay, I just practiced two questions there. Every time you practice a question, you just get better at it, man. Right? That was pi r squared backwards. What about, you know, Sokotoa? Oh, here's that one where they put the triangle upside down. Oopsie. What, okay, we're gonna say, we're gonna call this 40 inches, and we're gonna call, we're gonna ask for x. Right? Yeah, and then we'll call this 30 degrees. Well, me, I always flip this around. So I'm gonna flip this. So imagine you took this and flipped it on that side. So there's your X and there's your 30 degrees, right? And there's the height, see that's the longest side. So that's how you figure out your Sherlock Holmes stuff. Look for units of measurement. Clues. This is the longest side. What is the longest side of any triangle? The hypotenuse. Right? So there's your 40. So, there's a little practice, boys. X down here. Oh, that's the adjacent. Hmm. Oh, what's this? The 40 here? The hypotenuse. Do we care about this side? No, because there's no action going on there. So, A and H. Hmm, well, it's a so katoa question. How do we figure out what's what? Oh, so ka toa. Let's do it. So ka toa. Always start in the bottom left hand corner. So ka toa. Okay, so now we've got A and H. Ah, huh? oh, A and H. So it's ka, right? So there's your triangle, too. Another working triangle. Ka. So, we got A, is that what we're looking for? 40 is H, and this is cosine. 
Uh, I'm just off the top of my head, if I cosine 30, I'm going to say it's 0.866. It's just a guess. And then you're going to multiply those two together. Now, before we, before you guys punch your sausage fingers into this calculator, supercomputer, if that's 40, you know that that's less than 40. So if you punch something into your supercomputer and you had anything, anything above 40, you should know it's wrong before you even say, oh, maybe that's not the right answer. 40 times 0 0.866, 34.64. And that's all the time we have for today, men. Oh, and ladies. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, I can't say men or ladies because that makes, it makes me tranny phobic or something like that. Oh, come on. Who doesn't like trannies, right? Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I don't know if I, once I start collecting more dumb questions, I will be doing a, like it's been a while since I did this video. It's been at least six months. Uh, I'm just collecting more and more dumb questions that are just ridiculous that people need help with. So the, my next, if I do another one in the next couple of months, it's only going to be a short 15 or 20 minute uh, video. But other than that, guys, study. Don't get tricked by stupid words. Read your questions. Read them a couple times. Read the answers. What's in the answer call? Read the question again. Take your time. And if you practice your math, you're not going to waste time on math. Like these Sokotoa questions or CVA questions or estimating questions, you guys should be going through it in 60 seconds. Done. Bang. Right? Gives you time to read. And oh, don't forget, for you guys that don't know this, and I explain this to a lot of guys, if you're not that smart, don't be afraid when you call the ministry or call the trade. Tell them you're mildly retarded or you don't, you don't read well. And they will set it up where you're allowed to bring somebody in with you. I know five guys that have brought, most of them have brought their wives just to help keep them calm and just think better, like take their time. And usually they try to bring in somebody, well, usually the wives are smarter anyways, but usually they try to bring in somebody smart. You can't bring a teacher, you can't bring a sheet metal worker, but you can bring somebody to help you read. And it's worked for several, not several, at least four or five guys that I know personally. All right, guys, all right, keep going. Bang some tin, man, bang some tin for the win, eh? All right, boys, later.